from film enthusiasts to gamers and theme park attendees, Chinese consumers represent a huge fan base and even bigger disposable income. And so we're going to spend a half hour here talking with um, two of the uh, leaders in media and entertainment today, both here in China uh, and in the West, um, and talk about what the future of entertainment looks like in China. Um, I have a great interest in this for many reasons. Um, uh, one, uh, I was partners with uh, Lee Ray Gan in starting a company called Oriental Dreamworks. Um, I uh, had the great uh, pleasure of literally coming here once a month for seven years. I'll say that again, <laughs> once a month for seven years. Um, and uh, just found it one of the most amazing and rewarding uh, parts of um, uh, my work at DreamWorks. Um, and, um, and I've seen firsthand the growing importance uh, and opportunity uh, here in China. And so um, with that, uh, I'm, I'm not sure that Li Regan actually needs an introduction. He is known as the Rupert Murdoch of China. <laughs> not sure what that means, but I've read it somewhere, so I'll repeat it again just so we can keep the mythology going. <laughs> Um, but um, uh, Reagan uh, has um, uh, the founder and chairman of uh, CMC, which uh, is China's first fund dedicated to media and entertainment investments in China and abroad. Uh, from 2002 to 2011, he was chairman and CEO of Shanghai Media Group, growing it into China's leading media conglomerate. Um, interestingly, uh, at 33 years old, which is when he began that uh, company, uh, he was the youngest media entrepreneur in China. Nine years later, when he left, he was still the youngest. <laughs> <laughs> so as I say, I'm proud to say that I had the privilege of being partners with uh, Raygon um, in building the first uh, state-of-the-art animation studio uh, here in China. Bob Simons is the founder, chairman, and CEO of STX Entertainment. Um, created in 2014, it includes among its investors uh, such major Chinese companies as Honey Capital, Tencent, and PCCW, making it the only entertainment company of its kind with significant Chinese ownership. In just a very short time, STX has become an important full-service studio with production and worldwide distribution of films, television, digital, and virtual reality media. Um, before STX, which is where I first met Bob, he was one of the most successful producers in Hollywood. Um, and, and with his uh, expertise uh, was comedy. And I think his movies at the time had grossed something like $6 billion, um, which is why he's looking so healthy. Um, so. The two of you are uh, very experienced in the, in the field of entertainment, but bring obviously very, very different perspectives to the Chinese market, very different approaches. So let me ask uh, actually both of you, um, the, start with sort of the same question, which is what is unique and distinct about the Chinese audience at this particular moment in time? So Raygon, want to go? Yeah, thank you, Jeffrey. Uh I think to answer this question, uh, I think I would, um, would like to touch three, uh, let's say, three dimensions. Uh, first of all, I think the, um, I mean, where um, is the new audience, let's say. So I think right now in China, the trend of the, um, you know, the urbanization and also the trend of the, you know, the huge, uh, the high penetration of internet and, 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 and mobile. Uh, really uh, create a lot of um, opportunities, you know, the new audience. I mean, um, not only in the past, you know, all the demand, most of the demand actually came from the top tier cities. But right now, because of the technology, because of the urbanization, so the huge demand is coming from the lower tier cities. 
I was here just yesterday. I went to a small town called 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 Xiaolan. Actually, it's you know like fourth tier, even fifth tier, you know, um, cities, you know, small town, um, you know, in in the whole hierarchy of the Chinese political you know system, you know, um, the, the 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 you know the governor of the of, of that small town told me um, he's going to build a you know a cultural uh, sports complex, you know by putting uh, 1.8 billion RMB, roughly 300 million USD. And uh, it's just, you know, small town. I mean, the, with population uh, 300,000. And they would like to put such huge investment into bu in, in building, you know, the, the, the facilities. So when those facilities are available, and also the, the people in those, you know, in those tier, lower tier cities, I mean, they're, creating a lot of demand. So that's one thing. The second thing I want to you know, emphasize is the, the younger demographic. I mean, those younger demographic actually is enabled or empowered by the new technology. And uh, um, they become the, 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 the new, new stream the, or, 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 the, or the mainstream for the, for the content's consumption. And uh, adjacent to that, um, the third dimension would be the, you know, especially those younger demographic, they're willing to pay. So you can see the pay model, especially for the, for the high premium contents, would be a major, major change, I mean, in China, in terms of the overall content, con you know, consumption. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> first off, I have to say it's just, to you guys, it's a huge honor to be sitting up here with both of you. I mean, I think you guys realize these are two of the giants of industry, both in the past and today, which is kind of awesome when you look at how both of you have thrived over the years and just keep getting more and more influential. Um, so first, I just had to get that out of the way. Um, I guess there are a few things that have, have, have shocked me in terms of the, the market, and it's, and it's beyond just scale. Um, everyone talks about how big the market is, but what I find really fascinating is how quickly it changes. It's the fastest changing audience base yeah. um, anywhere in the world. And one of the things that's amazing about the Chinese um, consumer is that they learn, they adapt, and then they move on with a pace that I can't think of another culture that's doing. And that creates a really interesting opportunity for content creators because you're constantly trying to keep up with where the audience is. And back in America, as we were, as, as, as we were just kind of like making movies and TV shows, you kind of knew what the audience was and you're playing to the audience and it was very, very slow. And you could make a lot of money if you figured out how to hit that beat over and over again. Um, finding in China, that's a very, very different um, changing landscape. And that's a really cool and exciting opportunity. Another thing is that it feels like as China, um, as the standard of living continues to increase, we're going to clearly get um, a much larger um, insistence on access to even better entertainment and more entertainment. Um, which again, I think from my standpoint is a really cool thing. I mean, it's just, it's, it's really big right now and it's going to continue to grow. Um, but for me, the most interesting part of this is how the Chinese have been able to um, adopt new technology in a way that is completely um, not very American. So when I look at the advances that are being made in online ticketing, or in virtual reality and being in location-based in theaters. These are two things where in America we can sit back and say, yeah, 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 that's, that's, that's where we're going to go. But the consumer has been so trained in a certain way that it, it, the, the, it, it's a little slower. Here, it's just amazingly fast. And I look at, I look at some of the stuff that's going on with, with, uh, with online, and it's just it's incredible, particularly when... So, good. Yeah. So let me, but let me just say for a moment, let's kind of steer right at the... Let's just talk about the movie business itself because sure. in a very, very short period of time, just a couple of years, there has been this very fast evolution of the movie market mm -hmm. here in China. So one extraordinary scale. In another year or two, China will be the largest movie market in the world. 
Um, when we started together years ago, I think there was um, this ambition to bring Western storytelling to China. That was the holy grail. And I'll let you comment on the degree to which it worked and didn't work. What has worked clearly recently in the last year, two, or three has been um, ambitious, um, uh, blockbuster films made in China for China. And they have succeeded on their own terms and their own merits. They're not Western right. in any fashion, shape, or form. So you're coming at it bringing Western resources here. You come at it from a place where you've watched firsthand uh, you know, how Monster Hunt suddenly yeah. out of nowhere becomes the biggest movie ever in China and now uh, more with recently Warrior with Warrior. And so what's your point of view about this? Where, what is the future? What's the future of China in China? What's the future of China exported to the rest of the world? And what's, what's the future of Hollywood in China? Simple questions. Answer those in two minutes. <laughs> so, um, so Jeffrey, um, you know, um, you and I talked a lot about, you know, the, let's say, the Western style or Hollywood, typically Hollywood style of storytelling in the past when we started our, our business together. I think um, that's still that's very, you know, very popular, hot uh, conversation, you know, going forward. My sense is, um, first of all, um, even, even though we have, you know, the system of quarter, right, imported movie, for, for, for important movies, even though we have the system of censorship. Western contents still, the, um, I think, still occupy people's, a lot of people's, you know, time for consuming contents, you know, online, you know, because on traditional, conventional TV, very limited for foreign contents. But online, there are a lot. I mean, so Western, so you can see that, you know, as I just mentioned, a younger demographic, they're, they're, they're familiar with the, you know, the format of storytelling from Hollywood side. And those formats actually gradually educate their taste. And they become more and more, you know, acceptable to those Western storytelling formats. So that's the reason I think this trend eventually gradually um, influence the local industry, local sector, creative sector. So you can see that right now, even the local movies with the high box office, they try to learn from, and they try to, you know, you know change the, the model, the format, tailored to the, to the, to the you know, Western style or the Hollywood style storytelling. So the, the movies you just mentioned, you know, this uh, Monster Hunter and also the, the recent uh, the war, war worries. Actually, if you look at those movies, if you watch the, the movies, you can feel it's, you know, the story is China story, right? Basically, with a lot of China, you know, background and, uh, and, and elements. However, the pace, the rhythm, and, uh, and then the maximum of, you know, present, presenting the story is Hollywood. It's Hollywood. So that's the reason I think going forward, two sides will work together more closely than before. And that's the reason recently um, in Shanghai, we are working with um, you know, your friend, uh, Dr. Zhang, his school, uh, Shanghai Tech. Shanghai, Shanghai Tech is working with USC Film School mm -hmm. to create a program inviting uh, the writers, you know, um, the uh, directors, and the faculty from USC Film School to teach in Shanghai. So we have the mass class, right. you know, working with the local talents, you know, so I think that's the, and, and uh, that's, 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 that's one thing, one aspect. The other aspect I just want to, uh, want to um, you know, um, discuss is about the, you know, you, you just mentioned if China is, is going to replace, I mean, the export, exportation of the, of the contents, I think it's still a long way to go. Because it's not about one hit, not about one movie creating huge box office. You know, one hit doesn't, you know, means too much. The system, I think, is the major thing we have to consider. Hollywood is a system. Everything is about an industry. It's a systematic way of, of creating contents in a long way. 
So it's about education, about talent management, the system of talent management, about the whole system of the creative production, and even financing. So it's an industrial. So China right now, I think, to be honest, is still behind because of the, because of the system. It's an industrialized system for creating premium contents in a sustainable way. So that's my comments. Bob? Thank you for saying that. I mean, it, what's, what's interesting is that I agree with everything you just said, but it does feel very much like we're at an inflection point mm -hmm. where, I mean, I think you all know this. I mean, traditionally, America has exported sort of two things. We've exported military and we've exported culture. And that's about to change. And part of the reason that we were able to export culture was because we were, at the time, the one country in the movie business, we were the one country that had a big enough and vibrant enough domestic audience that we were able to build out the infrastructure that Ray Gong is talking about to not just satisfy our domestic audience, but then start projecting it into the outside world. For the first time in history, because remember this, the Italians, the French, the Germans, they'd make great movies. But they didn't have the infrastructure and the business to project out. For the first time ever, globally, that is changing, where you now have in China an audience, a domestic audience, which is, which is you know, mermaids doing $500 million worth Warrior, Wolf Warrior 2 did, I think, $850 million US. These are giant numbers. And you've reached this inflection point where for the last few years, there may have been some talk, but the local Chinese producers were much more interested in making movies for China and the Chinese audience because there was so much there that you now feel very much that there's an eagerness to start making movies on a global basis mm -hmm. um, in, our, in, our, in earnest. Now, what's interesting about something like Wolf Warrior 2, which is a Chinese film with, as you guys were saying, some Western elements, the irony is that a lot of the action in, in that film is very Western. It's very much like, um, like Avengers or uh, like uh, Captain America. Ironically, the Russo brothers who directed Avenger, who, who directed uh, 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 Captain America actually did those sequences. They, they, were, they were uncredited, but they were actually there doing a lot of the work. And um, the result was amazing. But what it does feel like is that there isn't, I, I say that as a, as a caveat because I don't actually think the Americans have anything to teach the Chinese. The truth is, when you have this big an audience that is so successful here, it, I think where this will end up is Americans saying, this is what we've learned about the rest of the world. What can you teach us about China? And in China, in China they, they come together. So I do think it's a big So when you set out to make a movie today, mm -hmm. how much are you thinking about the China market first, particularly given your Investment, investors and your uh, interest here in China, is that a first thought, a second thought, a non-thought? It's, it's always, it's a great question, it's always on the table. So given the fact that we need to make, market and distribute 12 to 15 movies a year, um, and because you need volume and scale to keep your system vibrant and to keep, your system, to keep the pipes full, um, what we do is we focus our energy um, within that on certain projects that some of our partners, whether it's Tencent or Alibaba, that we can sit down and talk about how to do what we call a proper co-production. Now, we've all seen those movies where they're Chinese with some Americans or they're an American film with some Chinese. They're not really working. They're not, they're not, they're not, they're, they're making all their money in one market and a little bit somewhere else or one audience is responding to it in the other. Um, we had actually just, probably a, a, a small example, but we had just done what we think is a proper co-production with Jackie Chan called The Foreigner. It was a small $35 million film. It'll do about $150 million worldwide when the smoke clears, and that's just box office. Um, half of the money came out of China, half of the money came out of the rest of uh, the globe. That was one of our goals going in. The other one was we got an A Cinema score in China, an A Cinema score outside of China. Uh, we wanted to speak to both audiences. But how we approach that and how we're approaching this going forward is to literally sit down and have a conversation with our Chinese partners and say, thematically, will this work? 
and that's not something that, that I was shocked. That's not something that we'd seen before. So whether it's Tencent or Alibaba, they're used to writing checks and getting the rights. They're not used to sitting down at the table and actually talking about how to co-do this. This is probably something you guys did a lot at DreamWorks, um, Dream, Oriental DreamWorks. But um, when we sit down, it's very much at the, at, at, at the, let's find the common ground. So having these two leading giants, both Tencent and Alibaba, as partners, investors in your mm -hmm. business, what do they do for you here in China? What, how are they impacting your business? What are the resources that they're able to bring? What's the advantage that you have today versus the guy down the block? So one of the interesting things is, you know, Tencent, who's one of our owners, you can't go through the day in China without touching Tencent. It's, it's just, they, they, they right? <laughs> and, um, what we find in, when we deal with them is they give us a point of view creatively on what they think will work. They have access to data that we don't have. They have their finger on a pulse of, of what um, they think will resonate here. Because when I was younger, I produced a bunch of comedies. In fact, I worked for Jeffrey on a number of those comedies. Comedies don't travel, um, uh, but emotional resonance does. So it's forced me and my team into a position where you try to find that universal theme, that thing that speaks to the heart everywhere else. And, and I can't fall back on just something as simple as a comedy. The, our partners in China creatively help us find that theme that, and that those values that resonate across all cultures. It's, it's much more than just, hey, cast this person or cast that person. Um, <clears throat> and once you've made that movie and you go to release a movie here in China, the, what's the leverage, what's the resources that you, know, um, that, that you get from these companies and the power of their platforms? It's amazing. I mean, uh, uh, look, we were the beneficiaries of, of uh, just referring to it again, the, the, just because it's recent, the, the foreign or the Jackie Chan movie. We were released during Golden Week. Now, it's a co-production, but it was, we had Chinese partners and we were placed in a super, super profitable release window um, that the government and the, the powers that be were able to sort of carve out a nice runway so you could just chug along. This is something that we don't have the benefit of in America. I mean, when we release 12 to 15 movies, when Jeffrey was running Disney, you were releasing 25 movies a year, um, we're all piling on the same dates. And it's, there's a lot of cannibalization and there's a lot of chaos and a lot of fighting to get that audience. And what we're seeing here is that depending on your partners, it's a much more organized, thoughtful approach, um, uh, like a lot of things here. So, Raygon, the, um, talk about on the investor side of the business. Uh, in 2016, there was, uh, I think, uh, just over four and a half billion dollars of investment capital from China into Hollywood. In 2017, it will be less than 400 million. <laughs> que pasa? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's going on? I mean, um, maybe um, two points um, around this topic. First of all, I think um, government is sensitive and they're sending a lot of warnings to the, to the you know, entertainment sector mm -hmm. to do overseas investments. And the, some of the company actually who are very ambitious in this area um, they had very high leverage in the domestic market. So government is concerned about, um, you know, that would, uh, you know, to some extent jeopardize the local banking system. So that's, I think, the original uh, thought from the, from the government perspective. On the other side, I think um, I think China investors, especially, uh, need to be more sophisticated. I mean, to some extent, from the Western, you know, 
world, you guys look at China, there are a lot of dumb money, right? To some extent. Not me, I never <laughs> use that word. <laughs> I mean, but, uh, but it's a fact, you know, to some extent. Well, listen, every part of the world has, has dumb money. Yes. Says, you, don't, you don't have a, there's nothing unique about China in that. It, I mean, there's some very, very, I, there's some incredibly yeah. smart, brilliant. <laughs> sure, 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 definitely. Smart as money as you can get yeah. in China, but you know, there are people that maybe are not sophisticated and don't yeah. understand it, but that happened. Money came out of, you know, Germany and Italy and the UK and yeah. India and like the list is endless. It's not, there's nothing unique about so it. So I think, you know, slowing down the pace of the investment, getting let, you know, all those investors getting, getting, getting mature might take some time. And I think um, there, will, there will be some lessons from all those investments. So do you Maybe think investment will pick back up, that they'll be smarter, I, more sure. sophisticated, yeah, I'm sure. learning, and they'll, right. you know. I think learning curve should be, you're already, already there, right? So some people take lessons, some people will continue to, 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 to proceed. And I see um, the momentum is still there, I see momentum is there. You know, the basic, I think, the, the, the logic, or also, yeah, as, as also my, my belief is, going forward, I think, you can see the trend. I mean, globally, US, North America, still the major you know, market for the content consumption, right? So China is coming up. And uh, my belief is China and the US, or the North America and, and China, will be two engines to drive the whole, you know, whole media entertainment mm -hmm. globally. So I think the, those exchanges, you know, cross border investments, overseas investments, still will go, will, will go, will go forward. So um, something we talked a lot about, I think, probably still continues today. One of the pillars of soft power mm -hmm. was how uh, can China compete? not only with its content that, he made, that is made here in China, but importantly, how does China become an exporter uh, to the rest of the world? Um, how, do you, how do you jump that, that hurdle, which truly has not happened yet? Do you, do you have a path to do that? Is there a strategy to accomplish that? Uh, today, because right now it's pretty much a one-way street. Western content comes here, even when you have these blockbuster hits, you know, Wolf Warrior and, and Monster Hunt, two phenomenal movies, they did not travel the rest of the world. How important and how do you overcome that? I think first of all, I mean, this kind of the, let's say this kind of the, um, the move, you know, from the domestic market the contents from domestic market gradually can be traveled around the world. This move is not a purely a government-oriented, you know, um, you know, uh, task. It should be a market, you know, at least it's, it's marketized, you know, uh, aggregating a lot of forces from from the market. And uh, what I can see um, positively. First, um, I think um, the market is, is aware of, you know, we need expertise, you know. F for example, we just mentioned storytelling. We need all those format expertise and uh, professionally. Mm -hmm. And then we can translate, we can present our story in a way which the whole world, especially the Western world, can, can ap appreciate. So, Bob, go on. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that sort of tying together something that you both said, which is kind of really interesting, which is Jeffrey's talking about soft power, which is the projection of values and projection of culture and projection of thoughts. And you're talking about slowing down the investments yeah. uh, in Hollywood um, for a whole bunch of reasons which you had laid out. It is tied to that inflection point of the realization that, that um, you know, we oftentimes forget that those of us in this, this silly word called entertainment, which is really more media, is a public trust. I mean, what we put out into the world is 
affects people. It affects the way they not just feel, but it can affect the way they think, especially if an idea gets catches hold. And it's a very potentially dangerous situation. And when you've got so much size and explosive growth happening in China, um, it's a really interesting dynamic. So, but in my <coughs> yeah. partnership yeah. with Reagan, we, we, one of the things that he imposed on me was to say, I need stories that have an authenticity and an origin in China that can be told in a Western way and exported to the rest of the world. The best example of that was Kung, Kung Fu Panda. Yeah, and he said, as your partner, you must replicate that path. Not exactly that movie, but that idea as a goal. He imposed that on our partnership, and it was, and I didn't feel, I mean, it was a good imposition. It wasn't, didn't, didn't hinder us in any fashion, shape, or form. It just added yet another dimension. How much are your partners asking, demanding that of you? Great question. So, um, never overtly. And the way we sort of look at this is, I look at something that was a fabulous global hit like Kung Fu Panda. I'm not sure at that point, I think we might have talked about this, that a lot of the things that you were doing that made the film so appealing would have actually gotten cleared uh, when you did them. And um, maybe, that's, maybe that will have, it will have changed by now. But oh, it that's a decade ago. Yeah, so, but I mean, but, oh, but, but very different environment today. But I think one of the frustrations that a lot of uh, American uh, entertainment companies have found, and I and I don't share this frustration, has been they look at China as a market that they need to reach their hand in and pull out as much as they possibly can, and there's a force pushing back, which can be SARFed, which is the state agency for film, television, and radio that basically says what what clears and what doesn't clear. And the American attitude is constantly, how can I get around those rules? How can I negotiate getting around those rules? Um, and it causes a lot of friction. One of the things that we've worked very much with our partners on is to try to approach that from the opposite side, which is, what are we trying to thematically embrace? I mean, are we trying to understand that film and film can be educational? and you want things that are aspirational and kindness and what values you're actually trying to promote. And that for me is the biggest difference in terms of our partners. Good, appreciate just, it. Yeah, just, just two, very quickly, two points, you know, um, adding to my, my, my comments. I think besides the expertise of doing a you know, high, good movie, uh, good contents. I think to another t two points we should we should emphasize is you know one is it's rely it will be relying on the innovation and the uh, involvement of our ideology. That's one thing. Second thing is I think public technology. A lot of new applications, new you know, will help China. You know this soft power exploitation. Huh? So we only got a minute left here. Yep. Tell us what's the future of location-based entertainment and sports here in China? And you have one minute to do it in. <laughs> Definitely, I think <laughs> that's the area we are, we are focused. I think those areas will be a potential great you know, opportunities for all investments globally. Yeah, and with the, the themes of the you know, consumption upgrade with the middle class, you know, growing middle class, mm -hmm. and huge demand from so, so what's the variety? People want to know what what's the opportunity here? What kind of location-based entertainment? What kind of sports opportunity are you looking for as an investor today? And to to how are you building that out here? In right now, we are doing basically two things. One is the heavy model theme park, you know, location-based entertainment, heavy mo heavy, you know, um, you know, investment and operation. The other light models. We are doing a lot of events. And I think people are not, you know, people are social animal, right? They, are, they, they use the personal device, mm -hmm. but they, they still need a group experience. So offline experience, like festivals, like, you know, concerts, you can see the, the momentum. You know, from all the statistics, all the numbers, you can see the momentum from offline experience. So online, definitely, Tencent, Alibaba, they are doing a lot. Then offline is a, let's say, a vacancy. Right. for the people to, to, to consider. So with the blockbuster success of Disney Shanghai, which I know you were very, very instrumental yeah. in bringing yeah. that to Shanghai and a partner and investor in it, will there be more Disneys in sure. China soon? Yeah. 
uh, I think all the you know theme park operators are desperate to finding you know to find you know the, the good locations in China because China population is is quite scattered. So there are a lot of opportunities from those. Let's, let's I just mentioned it, lower tier cities. Right. Huge demand for location based entertainment. Time is up. Thank you very much. Thank Both you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.